an introduction to wild bird identification with, towards the end of the presentation, some actual um, bird imitation done by none other than me. Uh, so we'll get started. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself and then we'll go right to um, helpful tips on identifying wild birds. So I am an ornithologist, a scientist who studies birds, and that's me holding up binoculars at uh, sunset. And you'll notice on this slide the shield of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I worked for them for 12 years as a wildlife biologist, mostly as an ornithologist, studying birds all over the country. And uh, Afterwards, after I did that for 12 years, I left and started my own business called Three Birds Consulting, and I do all sorts of work to conserve wildlife and habitat. And some of it's out in the field, and some of it's from my computer, and some of it involves talking to people like you, which is always a lot of fun. I'm just going to tell you about one highlight from my 12 years with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Now, have a look at this picture. I'm the person crouching down with the hat on, and um, standing above me is an intern at the time. Both of us are on an island looking at birds. Now look carefully at this island. There's cactus there. This is in South Texas. So on this island, we were looking among the cactus for eggs. There were eggs in the cactus. Now, what do you think was laying eggs in the cactus? What was the bird that I was studying? The black-bellied whistling duck. Now, have a look at this bird. It does have a black belly. That is a belly on the bird, a little lower than you might imagine it on a person. And it does whistle. That's how it sounds. And it was very unusual because um, these birds nested on islands, on the ground, in cactus. And we were looking at um, their survival in this really inhospitable habitat because the lake itself was very saline, very salty. And that's what I was studying at the time. And to me, it was really um, a highlight because number one, I was answering a question that uh, would be helpful with conservation of this species. And number two, they were just so fascinating, their behavior, and it was exciting to be able to watch them and learn more about them. There was, okay, so there's one other highlight of my career. That is me in the blue suit. That's the mascot of U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the blue goose. And I got to be the blue goose once, and uh, I enjoyed that very much. If you ever have a chance to be a mascot, definitely do it. So why birds? Why do I want to study birds? Why might you want to learn more about birds? Well, they're fascinating and diverse, right? From the smallest little one, this little hummingbird, and yes, that's it. it's actual size with that penny. And no, it wasn't really carrying the penny. That was photoshopped. But uh, they range from tiny little birds like that that feed on the nectar of flowers to this huge ostrich, which doesn't even fly. Additionally, many birds are really very colorful, like this common moorhen, or adorable, like this baby piping plover, piping plover chick. And of course, they can be regal and elegant, like this osprey, also known as a fish hawk, and you can watch them do many amazing things. Here, this fish hawk, this osprey, is landing on a nest, and if you look in its nest of sticks, you'll see two little heads sticking out, and those are its young that it's about to um, talk to, probably not feed because it's not holding a fish, but it's coming in to interact with its chicks. And the final reason why birds is because they're everywhere. So these are backyard birds in, of the southeast, and look how many there are. And this is only half of the poster. And when I was looking online, I found posters for every part of the U.S. and, of course, ev everywhere. There's birds everywhere. Even I, I challenge you to find a place that's outdoors where there are no birds. If you go to McDonald's, they're there in the parking lot. And sometimes they're even indoors, too. Like. Um, the sparrows, how sparrows sometimes get into the airports and so forth. So birds, you can watch anywhere and uh, they can um, interest you no matter what you're doing. So let's move on to the big five of wild bird identification or ID. 
I'm going to talk about five aspects, location, habitat, behavior, appearance, and sounds. Um, the two I'm going to concentrate most on are number three, behavior, and number five, sounds. That's not because the others aren't important. It's just that I want to spend a little more time on those. So location. Uh, perhaps some of you had time to go to the library and get out some birding, bird field guides, like Peterson Field Guide, National Geographic. A field guide shows the bird's picture so you can identify it. And it inc also includes what's known as a range map, like this map here. So I would like you to figure out your location now. At the top is North America, of course, and South, we have South America, Central America in between. Um, I apologize if you are somewhere that's not shown on this map, but you can imagine where you, well, if, if you're not on this map, why don't you pretend you're someplace on this map, say pick a state. Um, purple is mostly the US, but not entirely. So find your location. Now, we're going to think about the range of this bird. This is the range map for the American robin, which is shown here. Its Latin name is one of my favorites because it's kind of funny. Its Latin name, and every bird and every animal has its own Latin, Latin name, which doesn't change. Its common name, American robin, may be different from place to place. Robin, not so much as some others, but uh, its Latin name is Turdus migratorius. Yes, that's a good one. So anyway, uh, so find where you are now, your location, then look at the color of where you are. If you are in the purple, then go down to the legend. That's purple says year round. So that means that's that bird's range year round. You're gonna find that bird there year round. Uh, so if you are in the orange area, what does that say? Summer or breeding. So that bird will migrate up there in the summertime for its breeding. And then if you go down to the blue, the blue is for winter or non-breeding, and that's further south generally. And some birds will have a yellow spot, which is where they're just seen in migration. And that's good to know. So it's important, of course, to know where you are, what's your location, but then also to know the range of the bird. And that's going to help you identify what bird it is, especially if you've got a bird field guide. Oh, and a little tip is, if you get a field guide, mark it up. Don't be afraid to do that. So circle the birds that are in your home state or in your home county or your region, the ones that you're going to see, and then put an X next to the ones that you're not really likely to see, because that'll help narrow down the number of birds. OK, so moving on to habitats. I hope you've all studied habitat. I'm, pr I'm pretty sure you have. Habitat is where the bird nests and finds food or shelter. These can be really, really helpful in identifying the bird. So take a close look at the two birds depicted here. They're very similar. Now see if you can figure out how, what, how they look different, just in the birds, how they look different. You might see uh, the bill colors different on them, right? You might see that across the chest around the neck, one bird has two rings or collars, while the other has one. And look at that leg color, yellow on one, orange on the other. And look carefully at those orange legs. What do you see? Ah, some color bands and in the, uh, uh, I think it's blue, color band. And then on the upper part of the leg is an aluminum band that will have a number on it. That's because that bird is um, a special bird that's endangered. It's a piping plover. And the bird on the left, the other bird with the two rings is a killdeer. Now, if you were looking at them from far away through binoculars and you couldn't look very, very closely at the leg color, the bill color, they would look really similar. But if you looked around and saw what habitat you're in, that would give you a good clue as to which bird it might be, okay? Because the killdeer, you could find a killdeer nesting in a parking lot or a field, whereas the piping plover you're only going to find at the beach or coastline, um, sometimes the beach, the beach of the ocean, but also of some rivers and inland lakes, places where it's mostly sandy. And that's where you'll find the piping plover. 
other places, the killdeer. Now the killdeer actually is found pretty much across the country, so you could see those anywhere. All right, moving on with habitat, which is an important clue. I've just depicted here some different habitats you could be in. Of course, we've got the beach and the desert, the big saguaro cactuses. Then we have a marsh, if we're going continuing clockwise. And then we have a lady with her bird feeders. That's your backyard habitat. If you don't get out to exotic habitats, don't worry about it because your backyard habitat can have a lot of birds, especially if you provide some of the necessities of birds, of their habitat, which is food. You can provide food. You could provide water. And you could provide shelter, nest boxes. So if you're interested in seeing more birds, then work on your backyard or local habitat too. So if you've got your field guide, if you decide you want to be go do more birding, you can write some notes about the habitat of the bird next to it in your field guide, and that will help you um, be able to narrow down what you're looking at. So moving on to behavior. Um, oh, and I've got a question, two questions. Let me take care of let me answer those before you go on to behavior. I can't change the color for the link. I'm sorry about that. Um, you could just try cutting and pasting it. And then do I have a pet bird? I do not have a pet bird, but I do have bird feeders. I'm looking at one right now. I've got them all around the house. Three different bird feeders um, and suet because I live in the woods and I also look out on the lake, so I can see a lot of birds. I don't really need pet birds because I see so many out here, including really exciting bald eagle. There's a bald eagle nest that's only a half a mile away from here. So we see the adults sometimes, and then sometimes the young birds too, after they learn to fly. Okay, so moving on to behavior. Bird's behavior includes how it flies and how it eats. That can help you identify it. Because like people, you know, different birds are going to behave different ways. Some birds, um, some birds play and other birds don't play. Some birds fly. Obviously, most birds fly, but not all of them. Some of them swim and some of them run, don't fly at all. So let's move on to flight pattern, though. So flight patterns is how the bird flies. It's between feet to rhythm and speed. So it might flap and flap and flap, or it actually might go flap, 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 glide, flap, 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 glide. Some birds will just fly straight, right? If you look at them flying through the sky, it's like a straight line, and others will go up, whoa, and then they'll go down and up again, like a woodpecker. And um, I've got something to help you remember this. It's a tip. So this tip is learn the flight pattern principle song and sing it often. So I am going to sing for you the first time, and then you can sing with me the second time. Okay, a little hard to see. Let me, let me back up a little bit. Okay, wings in a V for a vulture, wings straight out for a hawk, never in a hurry for a seagull, always in a hurry for a duck. Quack, quack. All right, we're going to do it one more time. I hope you're singing along. Unfortunately, I can't hear you but I'm gonna assume you're singing along. Okay. Wings in a V for a vulture, wings straight out for a hawk, never in a hurry for a seagull, always in a hurry for a duck. Quack, quack. So what does that teach you? I love this song because it's fun to sing, but also vultures do actually hold their wings in a V when they fly. It's also called a dihedral. But if you look up in the sky and you see a very big, dark bird, and, and its wings are in a V, chances are it's a vulture, either turkey vulture or a black vulture. Then hawks and eagles hold their wings basically level. Sometimes they have a slight V, but most of them are pretty level. Then a seagull um, is a great flyer, and its wings are big, and its bodies are relative. Typically, body is relatively small compared to the wings, so it doesn't have to fly really fast to stay aloft. So it's not in a hurry. Then think about a duck, right? Ducks are kind of fat and bulky. That's because they need that weight to dive underwater or tip over and get stuff out of the water. So when they fly, they've got this big, heavy body and these fairly small wings, so they have to fly really fast. 
So that's a good way to help you with behavior. So um, I had a video for you all to watch. Um, well, before I go on to that, uh, let me answer some more questions. Why can't penguins fly? Think about a penguin. I was lucky enough. You might not believe this. I can hardly believe it. I was lucky enough to hug a penguin once. I met someone who worked at San Diego SeaWorld, and I went there to visit, and I got to go behind the scenes and hug a penguin. And I could feel that penguin was solid. It was a lot of fat and also a lot of muscle. They spend most of their time underwater going after fish. So they are using their wings basically as flippers. And because they adapted to, um, to do that, to, to be great swimmers and also have that blubber, you know, fat to keep them warm, they lost the ability to fly. So they're swimmers instead. That's answering that question. And then a Mrs. S says that we love that song and we remember it from last year and everyone was doing the motions and that's great because that's a, just a really good song. So thank you for that feedback. So I had a video to show you, but unfortunately today the videos aren't showing very well. But I shared a link where you can find that video later if you want to. But basically what the video was showing was some, some more behavior to help you identify um, different birds. And so uh, we were, I was going to talk about eating and feeding. So instead of the video, I invite you to close your eyes and just imagine some of these birds. Some you've probably seen in person, and if not, you've probably seen them on TV. But let's think about how some of the different birds feed. So let's go back to our robin, Turdus migratorius. What, is that, what does that bird do? It is listening and then probing for worms. So it's going to be out on the lawn, sticking its bill in the ground, and pulling up a worm to eat. They do very well because there's worms all over the place. Um, okay. Let's go back to the very first bird in the presentation, which was the tiny hummingbird. How do they feed? Well, they drink the nectar of flowers. They have a, a long bill and a long tongue inside that long bill, and they stick it down into the flower, and they get the nectar. And you can also see them at um, feeders, where they drink sugar water. And they have uh, evolved to be able to hover very well, so flying but staying in one place so that they can feed on the nectar. That's a very distinctive behavior of a hummingbird. Now, what else? What else might you see? Well, let's say if you're on a city street in a more urban area, downtown or whatever, um, on the ground, around where there's lots of people leaving crumbs and pieces of bread and parts of ice cream cones and chips and stuff, you might see house sparrows. House sparrows are very adaptable, and they'll eat all the stuff that humans leave behind. So you probably see them hopping around on the ground and pecking at stuff, or in branches, or sometimes they might even come to the edge of your table and look for something. Uh, other ways of feeding? Well, what might scratch the ground and look for seeds or insects in the ground? Well, if you have chickens at home, chickens will do that. Here we've got wild turkeys, and I watch the wild turkeys do that. Then also um, grouse will scratch the ground to feed. Um, and I'll give you one more example of feeding, okay, which is a little disgusting, but um, it's useful, okay? What's going to be disgusting? What bird, what bird has no feathers on its head? Because if it had feathers on its head, it would make it very messy because it likes to eat dead things. Yeah, vultures, turkey vultures and black vultures. And actually, you might see them by the side of the road because when we hit things with our cars, unfortunately and sadly, um, they usually don't go to waste. Something will come eat them, and often it might be a vulture. Um, hopefully, they're feeding at the side of the road because they, they can't fly super fast. And so if they're on the road and you see one, tell who's ever driving to slow down because it will be hard for that vulture to move out of the way. So that's a little bit about behavior, which is really diverse in birds and can help you identify different wild birds. All right, so we're going to go on to appearance. There's a couple aspects of appearance. Size and shape is going to be very helpful. And you'll notice here I have a silhouette. And that's because that's a good way of looking at the shape. It's not looking at the colors or markings or anything but just the shape. 
This is a very big bird. This is actually a bald eagle with very broad wings, wide um, in both directions. Well, let's see, width that way, but also their thickness. And then we've got a crow, quite a bit smaller, but still a pretty big bird. You can see its tail is fairly long, and you can see its, its separate um, feathers, which is kind of neat. Get, what's that? It's on the ground. What's on the ground a lot? It's you know, fairly chunky. That's our robin, our American robin. Got a few more for you. This one. Now, let's not go by size here <laughs> compared to the others. Here's our hummingbird. All right, you got that one? Hey, okay, got another one for you. Who's seen this? It, look at those long legs. What are those long legs good for? Well, those long legs are good for wading. So, and look at that bill. It's got a pretty big bill. This is um, an egret or a heron. It's actually a great egret, but it looks like a great blue heron, too. So they're similar. And um, look at that long neck. They like to eat fish and frogs and other things that they can catch. Now, what about this one? What, what, what kind of bird is this one? Anyone know? What does that look like? Okay, right, it's a trick question. It's not a bird. It is um, a flying mammal, a bat. All right, good one. Uh, oh, there's been a real quest for me to sing the song again. Yes, I will at the end of the presentation, absolutely. Um, so what's this bird? This bird is found all across North America, so wherever you live, you may be able to see this. You will often, well, I would say most of the time if you see this bird, it'll look like this because you're seeing it at twilight, maybe at sunrise. It's a bird that likes the night. What is this bird? Can you guess? Dun, dun, dun. Who knows? Yes, the great horned owl. Are those horns on its head? Nope. Are they ears? Nope, they're not even ears. Owl's ears are at the sides of their heads, and they're actually offset. So one might be here while the other one's a little lower, and that helps them pinpoint their prey, what they're going to eat better by sound. The great horned owl. So those are some ways of um, using appearance to identify wild birds. Now, there's also color and markings. And your bird books are going to make a big deal out of the color and markings. Um, that's definitely useful, but it's even more useful to learn um, all five ways of identifying wild birds. Now, these are birds whose appearance, the name, uh, matches up with their appearance. So who knows what this one is? If you don't know, you can guess. Dun, dun, dun. Yes, a bluebird, a beautiful blue. How about this one? This is a red wing blackbird. Sometimes I forget and I call it a red shouldered blackbird because it looks like it's shoulders. It's not really its shoulders. I think it's more like its elbow in a bird, but red wing blackbird. And you know, it, it's okay to make up your own names for birds that you don't know the names of. It actually can be a lot of fun, especially if they're birds you're seeing on the television and you really don't know what they are. What's this one? Look at that. That's a Golden-fronted woodpecker, and the gold is this yellow right above uh, in the base of its bill. Now, here's a little bit about markings, and I'm not showing this to you to expect you to memorize this, but if you ever get really seriously into birding, there are some birds that you really have to look for these markings to be able to identify them to species. And if you look at the bird head, Look at all the different parts that you could look at. Eyebrow stripe, crown stripe, it's lower, upper beak, lower beak, throat patch, whisker mark, eye line. There's so much. Um, and if you want to learn these, it can be a lot of fun. But if not, you can identify most birds without needing to learn all these. So that moves us on to number five, which is the sound. Um, the sounds um, of birds, there, there are blind birders, so they don't see the birds at all. They only go by sound, and they can actually do an incredible job bird watching, bird watching in quotes, okay, because there are some birds 
you can only tell apart by sound. If you look at them, especially through binoculars, you can't tell them apart. For instance, a fish crow and an American crow look exactly alike. But, <clears throat> all right, I'm going to do the American crow. I bet all of you have heard, a lot of you have heard American crow goes, ah, 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 right? And a fish crow goes, ah, 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 ah. Very different, right? American crow is very um, strident, and a fish crow sounds sort of laid back. That's one way you can tell them apart. All right, I'm going to do another bird. Oh, let's see if I can remember what bird I was going to do. Hmm, what bird is this? Hmm, let's see if I do the right one. That's our great horned owl. You know what's interesting about birds, too, is just like people, they have different dialects. So a bird, like a great horned owl, is found all across the country. And you'll find in different places their songs and calls are slightly different. Many birds are like that, actually. So if you listen online to a bird song or call, uh, it'll be like uh, the gen generally the same, but there'll be a lot of different dialects. And I find that fascinating. OK, we got one more. Now, if, you're, if you are sensitive to loud noises, turn your volume down. This is going to be loud. I'm going to give you a moment. Turn your volume down or plug up your ears. It's going to be loud. And this is one I heard in person many years ago and learned to imitate because I loved it because it was loud. OK, here we go. Anyone know what that is? I'm going to do it one more time. <sighs> Peregrine falcon. They can be incredibly loud. And it's the female. This all shows pictures of the female. In the peregrine falcon, the female is larger than the male. And actually, lots of raptors or birds of prey, the female is larger. And scientists think that the male and female are different sizes because that way, when they go hunting, they'll hunt for different size prey. And they're not kind of competing with each other. So when there are babies to be fed, and babies like to eat a lot, a lot of food, then they can um, get smaller stuff and larger stuff. So, oh, so in terms of sound, so, oh, so in terms of sound and learning birds, I'm actually not very good at this, at learning them. My memory for bird songs and calls is not good. So I learn just a few species at a time, and then I try and, um, you know, go out and listen to them a lot. So, or you go out and you watch birds, and you, and you look at it, and you just listen to what it says, you know, what its songs and calls sound like, and then uh, gradually learn more. There may be a few of you out there who are really talented at this, and then you can learn 10 or 20 at one time, which is a lot of fun. And then you can um, go outside and listen to so many different birds. So just to review, the big five of wild bird identification that we went over were location. So where you are located and what the range of your bird is, habitat, uh, and you can mark up your field guide to, to, to tell you what habitat a bird's going to be found in, the behavior of your bird, especially um, flight pattern and um, feeding and eating behavior, what appearance or what it looks like, and sound. Oh, good. Everyone is making peregrine falcon noises. That's super. Yeah, it's good to do in a really small space, too. <laughs> it sounds even louder. So let's do, before I finish up and open up to more questions, let's do the song again. I'll go back to the, let's see if I can go back to the um, words, although maybe you've got it all memorized now. There we go. The Flight Pattern Principles Song. All right, I'm backing up so you can really see. Get ready now, everyone. Get ready for the vulture. Wings in a V for a vulture. Wings straight out for a hawk. 
Never in a hurry for a seagull. Always in a hurry for a duck. Quack, quack. All right. So um, we have some time for questions. Yeah, so can, can you make a bird sound? I'm going to assume you want me to make a bird sound that I have. I'm really not that good at it. I have friends who are so amazing at it. And they'll make a sound, and then the bird will even answer, which is really, really cool. Uh, we did the, the fish crow and the American crow, very horned owl, peregrine falcon. Oh, here we go. So um, what should you do? You know, after, if you want to learn to identify wild birds, go birding. Just go, you know, you can go to a national wildlife refuge near you or a park or preserve. They often have tours you can go by, led by someone who knows a lot about birds. Everybody loves when the young people want to go birding, students and kids. Um, and so they will treat you really well. Um, you can bird in your neighborhood. You can bird with binoculars or you don't even need to have binoculars. Actually, some of the best birders I know um, have bad eyesight. Uh, a teacher I had in high school had really poor eyesight, and he is the one who taught me to look at the shape or the silhouette of a bird and to really listen to it. Uh, so go birding and practice. Here's a couple of useful websites. And at the beginning of the chat, I shared the video. That video is by Cornell. So you can also go to the birds.cornell.edu, find all sorts of interesting things, and then get links to the bird nest cameras, which are really cool. Talk about spying on birds. They set cameras up right, pointed right into the nest so you can see when the babies hatch and what they're fed and all sorts of stuff. That's the end. Thank you very much for joining me. And go out and go bird watching. You are welcome. My pleasure. And 6B, you are welcome. MBTIH, you are welcome. I hope that you will uh, have seen a lot of these presentations and remember next year as well. Mrs. S, so glad this is, this is your third year. And I will, I will come back again, but I might have to learn some more bird calls for your class especially. <laughs> Bye, everyone.